I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Egro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the October 2018 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. My name is Francesco Egro, PRS Resident Ambassador from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And as always, I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Ari Savetsky from NYU and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. Today, we have the great honor of being joined by Dr. Gordon Lee as our guest moderator. Dr. Lee is a professor of plastic surgery at Stanford University, where he's also the residency program director, director of microsurgery and associate chief for clinical affairs. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thank you for having me. Before we dive into our discussion, I want to remind everyone that this article, along all of the articles that are discussed on our podcast, can be read for free on prsjournal.com. The article we will be discussing today is by Drs. Marisevich, Lin, Liu, Chang, and Dr. Hanna Sono from MD Anderson, and is entitled Interposition Vein Grafting in Head and Neck Free Flap Reconstruction. I selected this article because interposition vein grafts are very rarely used in our institutions due to the high risk of flap loss. So we always try to find an alternative solution if possible. And I thought the authors with their article provide some very important evidence for anyone doing these cases. So the authors aim to evaluate outcomes following interposition vein grafting in oncologic head and neck free flap reconstruction. They did so by conducting a retrospective cohort study of patients who underwent oncologic head and neck free flap reconstruction between 2005 and 2015 at MD Anderson. They reviewed the ablative and reconstructive procedure data and compared flap compromise and flap loss rates between free flaps with and without vein grafts. They evaluated the effect of vein grafting free flap outcomes while controlling for other potential risk factors for flap compromise and flap loss. And lastly, they explored the specific etiologies of free flap loss in individual vein graft cases in an attempt to determine if vein grafting played a causal role. The authors performed a total of 3,240 free flaps during the 10-year period, of which 7.4%, in other words, 241 flaps, required interposition vein grafting. Looking at preoperative factors, Radiation, chemotherapy, prior neck dissection, prior free flap, osteobradionecrosis, and multiple free flap surgery were more frequent within the vein graft group. The free flap compromise and flap loss rates were much higher with vein grafts. In fact, the flap compromise rate was 14.5% with vein grafts and 3.4% without vein grafts. And the free flap loss rate was 6.4% with vein grafts and 1.1% without vein grafts. They then performed further statistical analysis adjusting for potential confounding factors, but vein grafting was found to have 4.8 higher odds to flap compromise and 5.5 higher odds of flap loss. No differences were found for other factors like vein graft donor sites, but interestingly, a trend was found for decreased flap compromise when using a vein graft for the artery and higher when using it for both artery and vein. Individual review of each flap loss within the vein graft group identified no cases of thrombosis caused by anastomotic technical errors, arguing against the requirement of an additional anastomosis as an etiology for loss of vein grafted free flaps. I thought this was a fantastic paper, which I read with great pleasure, and I commend the authors for evaluating an important topic and conducting a thorough analysis of their vein graft cases and flap losses. My take-home message as a resin from this paper is twofold. First, avoid using a vein graft whenever possible. And second, that if there are no other alternatives, then the flap loss rate is potentially not as high as previously indicated. But I think these results might not be as translatable to all plastic surgeons because MD Anderson is a mecca for microsurgery with a high volume of microsurgical reconstructive cases and thus they have a wealth of experience and expertise. Therefore, what in their hands can produce good results might not be the same for other surgeons or centers. And I thought the fact that no cases of thrombosis arose within the graft exclusively was of great interest. 
Another interesting point was that the free flap compromise rates for when a vein graft was used for the artery was much lower than if it was used for, for example, the artery and vein. Even though not statistically significant, it might be due to the study being underpowered. Dr. Lee, I was wondering what were your thoughts of this paper and whether you think we can really draw any significant conclusions from the study given the small sample size and since there were such diverse preoperative factors, you know, like uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy and so on between the two groups. Yes, it's not very surprising that free flaps that require vein grafts had higher complication rates such as flap compromise and flap loss. These patients are clearly more complicated to begin with. That's the reason why these patients had vein grafts to start with. So the vein graft population clearly are a much more complicated group. And as you point out, they are different than the non-vein graft group. So the fact that the two groups are not exactly the same, one cannot say exactly that the vein grafts by themselves are bad, as you point out. And quite frankly, for these complicated cases, if you have to do a vein graft because your pedicle is too short to reach the recipient vessels, then you have to do a vein graft, and that's not going to necessarily change your management. Ultimately, I think what you pointed out was that ideally, you could avoid a vein graft altogether. And that comes through, obviously, careful preoperative planning, choice of recipient vessels, and appropriate choice of flaps. But as the authors point out in the paper, in the real world, sometimes things happen, either related to the flap harvest, which may result in a short pedicle. So sometimes vein grafts are unfortunately unavoidable during the course of an operation. So I agree with you. I think that the vein grafts by themselves, in the absence of any thrombosis of the vein grafts, would be hard to attribute to the cause of these flap compromise and complications. I think of it more like the fact that these patients had to have a vein graft reflects a greater problem of the complexity of these patients, and therefore that complexity would naturally lead one to believe that they would have a higher complication rate. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for your comments. I agree. In, in the, in, I'm, I'm obviously just a resident, but in the case that we had to use them, they were, as you said, unexpected cases because we tried to pre-plan and avoid the situation of vein grafting. So I thought it was really an interesting paper for someone who doesn't have as much experience uh, with vein grafting. What did you think about the paper, Nikki? I agree at the question of whether or not vein grafting could be seen as a separate risk factor in and of itself, I think it's a really hard one to tease out. And that was sort of the main point that I took away from the paper. But one of the comments the authors made that I thought was really interesting was they discussed the potential role of surgeon fatigue in outcomes and how that could play a part. And Dr. Lee, I was interested to hear your thoughts on this. How much of a role do you think surgeon fatigue plays? And is there a way that we can begin to account for this more consistently when we're conducting outcomes research? I found that comment quite interesting as well, that the authors discuss the issue and potential role of surgeon fatigue. There's no question that all of us who've been in these very long, exhaustive cases are subject to surgeon fatigue, and that this can lead to technical issues or errors in judgment or different kinds of things. We're all human beings at the end of the day. And we know that adding the vein graft procedure would clearly add operative time to the procedure. And admittedly, I would imagine that having to do a vein graft, which may not always have been planned for, would add additional stress to the surgeons. Unfortunately, the paper has no mention of operative times. So it's a little unclear exactly could the length of the surgery be contributing to that? And we don't have any specific data to report in this retrospective study whether or not the surgeons felt fatigued. Other types of elements that we don't know as a result of a retrospective nature of the paper is at what point or what time of the day were these procedures being performed? We know that with head and neck reconstruction, many times the extirpative surgeon performs the procedure first and then the plastic surgeon comes at the end to the reconstruction. So are these procedures being performed in the early afternoon or are they being performed later in the evening, which of course would be contributing to surgeon fatigue. So I do think it's a very interesting suggestion how much that played into it. 
but we clearly don't have enough data from the current paper, and it suggests that we need to have further studies, and you raise interesting questions. How do we measure exactly surgeon fatigue in surgery? And I don't know that I have the answer for that either. Well, thanks. It's a great place to start just to think about, you know, factors such as when is the surgery beginning? How long does it go? I mean, those are certainly measurable things that we can take a look at um, to help uh, sort of account for this. So thanks so much for your thoughts. Ira, what did you think about the paper? You know, I thought it was also a really interesting study. They did a really nice job in attempting to answer the question, you know, why vein grafts increase the risk of flat failure and sort of what we've discussed already, not necessarily the vein graft itself, but rather it's a proxy of, of how complicated the patient in case is. It was over a 10-year period to analyze about 240 flaps that required a vein graft out of a total of 3,200. I mean, those are impressive numbers. You know, the interesting part, you know, like we mentioned, they point out that there wasn't any intrinsic thrombogenicity or technical anastomotic errors associated with vein grafting in their cases based on their analysis and investigation. I'm curious to your thoughts, Dr. Lee, about do you think this holds true outside of head and neck reconstruction? Let's say we're using vein grafts in smaller caliber vessels, such as in digital vessels when we're doing digital replantations or revascularizations. Do you think their statement holds true for that as well? That's a very good question. It's a little bit, I think, complicated answer. Obviously, these head and neck patients are a very unique patient population. As you know, typically our KMD Anderson's a cancer center, so many of these patients have undergone possibly chemotherapy, radiation, osteoradionecosis, previous free flaps, et cetera. So this is a very highly complex population. You mentioned the issues such as in a, in a replantation situation where you might be doing vein grafts a lower extremity situation, again, where you might be doing vein grafts. I think rarely in breast surgery are we doing vein grafts, but that's also possible. So I guess to answer your question, the addition of a vein graft in any of these microsurgical procedures for those of us who do a high volume of these things does add an additional element of operative time, potentially stress, and potentially fatigue to a procedure. It stands to reason, therefore, that there might be a higher complication rate associated with that. But as we all know, there aren't any really very big, large studies to look at that. Certainly, it brings a question, you know, we should probably look at those things and look at vein grafts in other clinical settings and other parts of the body to answer that question. I agree. Those are some really great points. And sort of what Francesco had mentioned, I mean, whenever we're looking at data from such outstanding institutions such as MD Anderson and, or, you know, certainly out of Stanford, uh, such you or any of the institutions that we're affiliated with, I think, you know, we always have to take it into consideration that, you know, these are sort of masters and people that not necessarily transferable to everybody. I agree with everything that, that you said. Well, thank you all so much for a truly thrilling discussion. I really enjoyed today's podcast, and I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your friends and rate us in the iTunes store. Also, remember to tune in to the other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast. And finally, please join us this month for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we'll be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not yet done so already. And it is there where our monthly journal club takes place. Once again, Dr. Lee, it was an honor having you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.